what's going to happen is I'm going to bring them onto stage now. We're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll throw to questions. If, you've got, if there are any filmmakers in the crowd, this is a really interesting documentary because it used a lot of archive footage, uh, which kind of went through a lot of corners, which is amazing. So there's a lot to chat about. Uh, so if you've got any questions, think of them now, and we'll come to you at the end. So I'm going to bring on not only the filmmaker, the director, but also the band who composed the original songs behind this movie. Uh, so please welcome to the stage. It's the director, Charlie Line, and Summer Camp, who are Elizabeth Sankey and Jeremy Wormsley. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So this is Charlie, the filmmaker, and this is Summer Camp, Elizabeth and Jeremy. Hello. Hi. So, um, OK, let's begin by getting for you what the, the description, the, the sort of blurb for the movie is, for people who don't know it. Um, it's kind of, uh, the way I've been pitching it is it's a journey through the teen movie, um, through the eyes of hundreds of existing teen movies. Um, so it's a good time saver if you want to watch 300 teen movies in an hour and a half. Um, but it's also hopefully uh, a kind of analytical and evocative journey through that genre. And why why did you want to make this? Because it's you're you're British. Uh, it's you know you could have done a, a movie on the British high school system and, and the teen movies, but you went American. Why, why? Yeah, I think I mean like certainly I don't think I'm alone uh, in having very much grown up through these movies and this very specific world. Even though, you know, I might have instinctively been more attracted to the ones that were set in a kind of recognisable British setting. Um, this world, whether we like it or not, is kind of foisted upon us by the, the prevalence of American teen movies. And I think also it's, as opposed to a lot of British teen movies, it's a world that feels incredibly self-contained and, and familiar. You know, all of these films seem to coexist in this one setting, whereas kind of the blessing and the curse of, of British teen movies is there are a lot fewer of them, which is a shame, but it means they're all slightly more idiosyncratic and, and maybe less suited to being examined kind of en masse like this, you know, whereas these movies, for me, going in and watching one of them that I've never seen before, I still feel like I'm, you know, immediately at home because although all those tropes and traditions are so incredibly pervasive. Yeah, you do feel every time, like watching the movie, uh, every scene you go, oh, I feel like that was my upbringing and it just definitely wasn't. And that's that's quite, it's an amazing thing. It kind of feels as if you've been taken into a fantasy world, but it's definitely real in one bit of the planet. So it's, it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, and I think real because you you kind of inhabited it when you were a teenager, if you were as obsessed with these movies as I am. And so it, you know, the emotions of it are real because they were real when you first watched it. And so it's all very kind of wrapped up in, you know, for me, what it meant to me then and what it means to me now and the kind of distance between those two things. Yeah. So th one of the exciting things for me about this movie is that uh, I actually got to see this kind of be birthed, really, because you took it online and you asked for people to, to pledge to help fund it. Um, you So you got to go through the whole experience of watching a a debut movie being made. You brought in a band who obviously, uh, your friends obviously, That's I, I do know that, uh, you are a mate. Um, when you first heard about the idea from you know some guy who'd not yet made a movie, did you think, oh, definitely got to get involved or? Yeah, it was, it was really easy. We uh, were already friends with Charlie. He uh, used to, and still does, write about films and uh, put on screenings of new films. And uh, we, we both really love uh, the cinema so as soon as we knew that he was making a film I was kind of hoping he would ask us possibly to be involved I was thinking you know I hope he doesn't know any other bands because uh, I'd really like for us to get to do this and then he I asked think us I put in I, might, I, I asked long long before you were planning on making a film I said if you ever make a film we have to soundtrack it yeah see I don't Demanded. remember that yeah, and equally no. like it's funny Subliminal. that you say we were friends I don't really remember us being friends <laughs> in right. my mind like oh. <laughs> my <laughs> no i mean it in the opposite way like my my memory of our relationship not to turn this into too much of a loving was like me just being a fan who kind of pestered you occasionally yeah but i was a fan of you first right like charlie's so both an incredible well, film writer and works. i was a big <laughs> fan of his writing first so i remember being yeah very kind of flattered that you said yes and and feeling like i'd slightly kind of wormed my way into your oh, circle which is still how I feel now. I'm just pleased you booked us both for this sh show because I get to sit near them. Yeah, this is suddenly very Jeremy Kyle. Uh, 
<laughs> she perch on the edge, like yeah, Jeremy does. with one awkward person sitting in the middle, not wanting to be here right now. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I uh, I want to know the process of how do you go from having an idea in a bedroom, which is how this kind of this started, and and taking it from that point to where we are now, sitting here. Yeah, I mean, it never really left the bedroom. Like I, I spent most of today um, doing our accounts in that bedroom. Uh, we, I wrote the film in that bedroom, we edited the film in that bedroom. We found out about a month into making the film that we both lived in neighboring streets. And so the furthest I ever really got away was by going to their house and sitting in their bedroom. Uh, it was a film of bedrooms. Um, and and as, a, as a band, you've got, you've got two albums out at the moment. Those were recorded in studios, but this was this... I actually, we uh, we do most of the stuff at home in our home studio, which is in a bedroom, and, and that's where the bulk of this was recorded as well. We work best in pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, like it, all this side of things, like being in front of other human beings, uh, is still surreal because my like overriding association of this film is just seeing it like three feet away from where I sleep, um, and working on it in complete isolation. Um, so yeah, it was it was an incredibly insular process. But to go back to what you were, you were saying, um, the fact that we'd started with the Kickstarter thing uh, meant that there was always this, at least hovering somewhere in the background, this awareness that we had promised people they would get to see it. And I think had we not had that hanging over us, it probably would have been quite easy to, you know, just get distracted when you're sitting at home. There's lots of other stuff to be doing, you know, especially over the course of a year. Um, but knowing that it would eventually have to leave the bedroom one way or the other um, probably helped us to, certainly helped me to keep focused. And it, so at what point did Summer Camp, did you guys get involved in the process? Was it was it was the movie finished or did I you mean, start composing? We, uh, we were on board even before the Kickstarter was announced, I think, because we even did like a little soundtrack to the Kickstarter movie, uh, Kickstarter trailer, sorry. Uh, so and I remember like Charlie coming to us with this very vague outline and like there were red sections and green sections and the red sections were one sort of scene and it was all it was all there right from the start and uh this uh, for anyone who doesn't know this talk is following one from the filmmakers of uh, Divergent 2 and I believe they had a similar um <laughs> process with basic color coding and a single email outlining what the film would be um, it's, it's the it way to do it. It was really interesting, though, seeing how the film changed because in my head originally when Charlie pitched it to us, it was going to be a sort of, what's Devon Sawa doing now? And it became, I don't, if, if you've seen the film, you'll know this, but it, 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 become, it became a sort of film essay much more than a sort of behind the scenes, a clueless. Um, yeah, it's very beautiful and meditative and yeah. immersive. And that was really interesting for me because I don't really know anything about filmmaking. So seeing that, how that, how Charlie decided to tell the story and how that sort of evolved was really interesting. But also we did decide pretty early on that we would be kind of, you know, I, I didn't, mainly because I had no clue how to make a film <laughs> and still don't. Um, you know, I never wanted to like go away and make it and then bring it to Elizabeth and Jeremy and have them stick some music on it. Like I wanted as much help as possible from the word go. So we did pretty much from the beginning kind of divide up the film and they would take the lead on some sections, I would take lead on others and hopefully kind of come up with a sort of world of our own. So, okay, so you, you have this idea, you guys get involved. Um, most people when they're making a movie would use original material in terms of footage and so on. And one of the nightmares that I always seem to hear with filmmaking, with TV, is trying to use a clip, even two seconds, of a Hollywood movie would cost you hundreds of thousands uh, if you were doing international stuff. And you made an entire movie using the biggest, most successful teen movies of all time. I mean, surely that's nuts, right? Uh, it's probably this bit that's nuts, like telling th hundreds of thousands of people that we did that and potentially getting this podcast out to all those copyright holders. So um, let's abandon that question. <laughs> um, no, no, it is, it's, uh, yeah. No, it was something that I, that I think we all learned about along the way. Like I had a very loose understanding going in of, of fair use, which is the, the thing that we use to be able to use all the clips in the film. Um, and that just kind of grew over time as we made it. 
uh, culminating in sitting down with a, a very serious, very expensive lawyer and having him watch the film and then sort of go like, okay, good job. Here's what you need to change. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a, like an incredible learning curve uh, for me and but a really rewarding one, like because we basically, you know, I say that, but we we only changed one or two tiny things. I think the the great thing about that as a as a piece of legal precedent is that it's all about um, creating a, a cohesive argument, and so you know, it's less about like, oh, did you use slightly too much of this clip or slightly too much of this one, and much more about like, does the whole thing stand up as a piece of criticism and if so is every clip involved helping that that argument um so it's yeah it's an incredible thing and i think you know probably wouldn't have been practical 10 20 years ago because there were so few so many fewer uh precedents um mainly because the only way you could have made a film like this would be having millions of dollars being able to go from archive to archive getting all these film prints and putting yeah. it together like that rather than just spending a lot of money online yeah and the movie, it does, it does have a great narrative of explaining all those key moments in every single one of those movies, which you don't at the time when you're watching a singular one of them recognize is such a pattern of, of things that show up. The canteen scene that you have where you just show that moment where a new student will sit down and you'll have two people explain, those are the jocks sitting over there, those are the, the mean girls sitting over there, those are the, it's so, and, and then you have uh, the sexual awakenings, and you have, uh, how did you divide it up outside of knowing that there was an existing narrative of how these usually roll? But yeah, basically, it ju it's, it's one of those things that just, like, you know the scene in a film where someone, like, goes to the library for, like, four weeks, and you slowly see their face, like, grow in confidence until they just sort of know all knowledge. Yeah. Um, it was like that, but for a very, very small area of knowledge. So I spent about four months just watching all of these movies back to back and taking incredibly pedantic notes on each one. Um, and slowly, yeah, you just, you kind of get a feel for it. Like you can feel yourself getting to the 35 minute mark and thinking like, oh, probably some characters are, are gonna, you know, get in a swimming pool now. Or, uh, you know, at the, 80 minute mark, oh, we should be near graduation at this point. Um, so it became, yeah, it, it, it felt really organic by the time it actually came to like sitting down and starting to cut them all together, not least because they all cut together so easily. You know, I, I kind of thought it would involve a lot more kind of, you know, relighting, recoloring stuff or trying to make it all match, but they all feel like they were shot in the same school, and many of them were. Mm. Charlie, uh, did you have to do any like recoloring and stuff, or was it all? Did it all just? No, it's it's, it's all. Amazing. I don't think you're actually allowed anyway. I so that already. Probably good that we didn't. But um, yeah. Well, I mean that, and actually, uh, I there are certain schools in Los Angeles that literally dozens of the films featured in Beyond Clueless were shot in, and so you do start to notice like, oh, there's that corridor again. There's that specific arch oh, wow, that's really? been in, like, She's All That. Yeah, yeah. there's one in and Venice Beach, isn't there? That, uh, yeah, they're these. all, like... Y and I, like, I've walked past a few of them since, and it's weird, because it's like visiting a movie set. It's hard to believe that actual teenagers, you know, attend there. I just assume they all look incredibly beautiful and 27. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Uh, one thing I really wanted to ask, I was going through the Beyond Clueless IMDb page, and I love going to IMDb because I, the trivia section underneath either an actor or a movie, you know, what's Devin Sawa up to now? I'd head to IMDb, it would tell me. He's uh, on a really successful TV show, I yeah, think. He's doing is he? Right, is he yeah. doing well? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I, d I wanted to ask, but I didn't want to detract Which from is the why we didn't make the film about that, because it would have yeah. been too easy to answer. Oh, he's yeah, yeah. he's very wealthy he's and doing lives good. in he's Beverly Hills. Yeah. Um, but your your trivia section to the IMDb of your movie is empty, and I thought it might be interesting to break down into little nuggets what you would add to that section from the process of making the movie. Yeah, that's a good thought, because in fact, I probably can't add them, can I? Someone else probably has to add them. Oh, is that so the, is it like Wikipedia? A listener to... can load up the page now, maybe, and add them as we reel them off. Okay, so anyone watching um, this, if you want to add any of the things we're about to say... Uh, what is a good bit of trivia? It has to be fairly banal, but also sort of bordering <laughs> on Not interesting, too banal. right? Yeah. Um, there. Well, in fact, because the the one of the few moments where uh, the film did go beyond 
just a very small number of us sitting in a couple of rooms was when we came to uh, get our narrator on board. And um, I had had as my like dream choice since basically day one, uh, Feruza Balk, the uh, former teen idol of uh, The Craft and Almost Famous and various other films. But I knew nothing about how to approach actors or how to, you know, get in touch with agents or any of that kind of stuff. And so I did manage to like track down her agent and tried to, you know, get past that impenetrable wall of silence, um, which if you have no filmmaking experience, live on the other side of the world and are making a film for very little money is incredibly hard to do. Um, so we were like almost on the verge of giving up when uh, someone told me that Feruza Balk uh, runs a bespoke candle making company out of her home. <laughs> And I mani and on the Twitter account for the bespoke candle making company, I managed to find the complaints email address for the candle company, um, which I sent off this message to just on like the hope that someone there might know her and be able to put me in touch with something. And she replied within three minutes and said that she was watching like the little rough cut that we'd made to send to her. Um, and I, ne I still, even though I've, uh, mentioned this before, have not yet bought one of those candles. <laughs> but I hear they're really <laughs> quite good. What would people uh, complain about with a candle? Yeah, that's it worrying doesn't actually, burn. isn't it? Like did, you, did you phrase it as a complaint <laughs> as well? Yeah. No, it was like that was the good news. It's like, I haven't actually got a complaint about your candles. I don't want to add to the pile she, of complaints building up in this email If she'd been pedantic, she could have got address. annoyed that you were using the complaint email incorrectly. That's, that's true. true. Or maybe she gets so many complaints on the candles, it was just like a welcome relief. Oh, thank God. Like, oh, <laughs> someone is saying something nice about me for a change. Um, that's really cool. That's amazing. Do they all? Do all these kind of ex-teen movie stars have? Like yeah. Katie Holmes have a fish farm that she has <laughs> a complaint section for on her website. Is I that imagine so. They should all just have complaint uh, email addresses for their acting. <laughs> if you have any problems with, you know, <laughs> that would be the Feruza Balk's appearance in the Bad Lieutenant remake. Although she was really good in it, so I, I have no complaints. She's <laughs> almost, weirdly, for a voiceover, the perfect person because she was one of the few people who, in the teen movies that you would see, had the iconic voice. That you, I, she was almost as well known for her voice as she was for her physical appearance. You would, if I heard her voice, I'd know exactly who that was. Yeah, absolutely. And she has that thing that, that we were really desperate to get where she feels totally at home in that world of the teen movie, but also kind of like an outsider. So she's got this kind of innate kind of cynicism to her voice because she's kind of got that amazing drawl. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's so evocative because she's so closely associated with those movies that you, you know, it hopefully draws you in and then kind of tears that world apart from the inside. And she's, I mean, she features quite a lot in the movie Particularly, the, the prologue is basically, it's the craft. And so she's watching her, analyzing her through your ideas of the teen movie. Um, what was it like to explain yeah, to her that she, she was had to very, do that? She was very game about it, actually. I was slightly worried that like my readings of films that she's in might unnerve her or that she wouldn't be comfortable like you know yeah. putting those words in her mouth. Um, but no, she was amazing. I think she got right away that, you know, it wasn't her opinions, that it was basically a role she was playing as the kind of tour guide through this alternate universe. Um, and yeah, she she rose to the occasion immediately. Um, but yeah, there were some surreal moments and certainly watching the film, like there's often that odd juxtaposition where you're faced with her at 16, but you're hearing her now, uh, adopting this kind of, you know, omnipotent, godlike voice that she does throughout the film. Although the fact that her voice hasn't changed at all in 20 years means that it's quite a, a seamless transition, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've, we've actually got a few clips, and I reckon we should play one. Uh, you, perhaps you can pick which one you selected sure. the three. Yeah, I think, well, the first one is um, the title sequence, in fact, which is maybe a bit of a strange clip to show, uh, except that it's... It's hopefully a good introduction to the kind of concept of the movie that all these films are, are taking place in this shared space and, you know, a part of this one world with its very specific tropes and traditions. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, let's play that scene. 
That's so we got a taste there of one of the summer camp actual because there's a lot of there's a lot of um, sort of music without lyrics, but that's one of the actual songs that was on it. Can I ask quickly about the lyrics of the song? Yes. Uh, I don't have a specific question about like the, what the lyrics mean. That's Aww. what I want to. It's what I want to ask you about. What, when you were writing it, were you looking at all that territory, going, "I want to write lyrics that directly relate"? Because they don't sound like they were, that you were creating someone else's narrative in that. It sounded like. Um. Well, I know these films very, very well. I have been obsessed with them for a very long time. It's a world that I love, and we've written about the kind of teen teen movie genre a lot with our own stuff. So it's it's a place that I'm very familiar with. Um, I think what I tried to do, what we tried to do, especially with the lyrics, was to reference the films, but still have them work as songs. So actually, there's a lot of quotes from the films. So I went back and oh. rewatched a lot of them. So there's a lot um, in that song from Virgin Suicides and Ten You would make an, an amazing page on um, like rap genius. Yes. Because each one would have its own very lengthy citation, I yeah. imagine. Uh, very good point. But yeah, it w I definitely wanted to, because I feel like the language that's used in those films is scripts and they're so brilliant for so many of them that I, I wanted to use them as much as possible rather than like us trying to create like our own. A lot of the lines are just literally lifts from yeah, it, I just the films. We just stole, <laughs> basically. It's, it, that's, that's the main it's plagiarism. Fair use, fair it's use. sorry, fair yeah, use. that's what, it's fair use. Oh. Um, <laughs> right, so that's twice now that this movie is going to be attacked by lawyers around the world. Yeah. No, no, there's some of our own stuff in there as well. but. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, well, despite the teen movie references, I thought it worked as well or better on Made in Chelsea a yes, few weeks that ago. that was great. Yeah, that was definitely what we were thinking when we wrote yeah, that song. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it was quite interesting, actually, because um, when Charlie first approached us, I and again, not really knowing what the film was going to be like, because it didn't exist yet. I imagined, when I was thinking about it, there's so much uh, in the original soundtracks of those, especially in the 90s, there's a lot of kind of pop punk, you know, Blink-182 and, and stuff like Smash Mouth. And, and in my sort of mind's ear, to create a really pretentious phrase, I sort of imagined that our, our soundtrack was going to somehow kind of embody that sort of sound, but kind of filtered in, in some unusual way. And we sort of did something along those lines for the Kickstarter trailer. And then as soon as I started trying to put that onto any of the images that Charlie sent over, it just it didn't work at all. And we had to completely, I don't think we ever even sent you any of the stuff that we did that was along those lines because it you was so... You will never hear it. Ab ab <laughs> abjectly <laughs> terrible. And we completely had to reconceptualize what, what we were going to do for the soundtrack because obviously that, that didn't work at all. And it's quite interesting that I think um, in the same way that... Um, there's a there's definitely a commentary that's inside the world of the teen movie, but the ideas are sort of outside it, if that makes sense. So like, although in the film, uh, Fruza never refers to any of the actors by their n actor's name, but only by their character's name, uh, the music is never sort of in. It's never kind of teen teen movie film music. It's it's just sort of an atmosphere that exists. Uh, outside of that context, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's like the spirit of it, isn't it? I mean, yeah, like, exactly. Because I think I remember in that uh, much cited color coded email, um, my prompt for that sequence was uh, something like I I one of those kind of amazing, bombastic introductory songs in teen movies, like I think I referenced the Missy Elliott track that plays in Mean Girls when you first see them all like walking down the corridor together. And obviously and that would that's have probably worked almost as well as what yeah. we came up with. <laughs> that's really what I wanted you to do, was write a Missy Elliott song. Um, but yeah, although it's nothing like that, I think it achieves hopefully a similar thing, which is that kind of feeling of like exaltation. It was really great as well, writing the music with the visuals, which we did a lot, and Jeremy would sit there and watch it. And <laughs> I love not actually like playing on the keyboard along with it, but it, it was... Sometimes. It, sometimes, but it did definitely kind of really inspire us and to be having it passing it back and forth so quickly and easily that's why technology is good guys um <laughs> did on we our write it on, on our apple max oh yeah we did we did <laughs> it on we this did is a both mac. use uh, apple products we used uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's gonna go on a no it doesn't, <laughs> <that's not. laughs> 
<laughs> no, but it's I, it is like I've, I if you go on YouTube, you can see so many examples of um, of soundtracks being written that they've recorded while a movie's being made. I Heart Huckabees, you can see John Bryan sitting with the director, talking through, playing along as the movements go. One of the best clips you'll ever see online, if you can be bothered to look at it, is the writer of the Twin Peaks theme tune describing how David Lynch was over his shoulder and he gets emotional and he's going, Angelo, it's an amazing clip, highly recommend watching it. Um, but it totally, particularly with this movie, the music does actually really define the tone. Music so often does in films, as we know, really makes you feel the thing that the movie's trying to get you to feel with the imagery. Um, and what I, what I really like about it, which would be another nice little trivia bit for IMDb, is that you guys really are now a bit more of a team past the making of the movie, because when this movie gets played in certain bits of uh, the country, you two go along and you play the soundtrack live as the movie's going on, which must be a pretty amazing gig to do, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's, fun it's funny, actually, just watching that sequence there, because when we do it live, during that sequence, obviously we have our backs to the screen so we don't watch it but there are sequences in the film where there's where we're not playing and i've we must have watched them 10 15 times and we can probably almost as many times as charlie has seen them and we can kind of recite along to it but that <laughs> just there i was actually noticing stuff that i hadn't thought about since you know we actually recorded that that tune so that's funny i find it me. gets better every time i see it <laughs> when was the last time on you my 300th viewing i really finally got what i was going for <laughs> Um, should we should we watch another clip before yeah, we go sure. to some questions? Um, what would you like to? Play? Uh, well the next one is. Uh, it, I hope this isn't confusing. It's kind of the tail end of a sequence about um, she's all that, and it leads into uh, a musical sequence uh, soundtrack by Summer Camp. Um, but it's a moment where, uh, more so than in the first clip, the audio and the the kind of reality of the clip is intermingling much more with the the summer camp soundtrack um and yeah it was something we were really keen to do as much as possible was kind of blur the edges between what was you know the, our original material and what was our sampled material okay i hope that's clear it might not be should we should we go to some questions yeah. Maybe we should. Does anyone have a question? Oh, we have one just here. Hang on a sec. We'll just get you a microphone. Hi. I've not had a chance to see the movie yet, but I really, really want to. I wonder, I think now you are the expert on team movie. Must be. Do you have any plans to make one of your own? And if not, what are your next? Pro what is your next project? Yeah, I, I kind of thought the same until I, we started screening the film and people came up to me with all the omissions that I didn't realize I had made. Um, it turns out there are hundreds of people much uh, better equipped to make this film than me. Um, but yeah, that said, no, it, like, it's, it's a genre that I really love and somehow after making this only kind of appreciate more. Um, I had, after the film came out in January, um, I did like 15, uh, like tour nights back to back doing Q&As in different parts of the country and my first day off after that I found myself watching the 2005 Michelle Trachtenberg vehicle Ice Princess at home on my own so my yeah my like impulse to to watch those movies hasn't uh, diminished clearly um so yeah I would no I would happily make a teen movie I mean this is uh pretty much the the closest I could get uh to making one, I would say, without actually going ahead and casting a load of 30-year-olds to, to play 15-year-olds and shooting in one of six American high schools. Um, but if anyone will give me that opportunity, I will happily take them up on it. If you secretly are a very wealthy film financier <laughs> and want to get me to do that, I will it's do that. It's a lucky night. <laughs> <laughs> Just just a quick follow-up to that question about being an expert. Um, there were a lot of movies in there, and I believe there's a list online that you can get now of every single movie that uh, appears in it, right, on the Beyond Clueless website? Is yeah, right? well, in fact, well, if you go on your cherished IMDb page, or if you go to everyfilminbeyondclueless.com, which okay. is probably easier. So, quick question is, there was a lot of movies that obviously I knew the classics, but there were a bunch that I was like, what is this? And I don't know if I just missed them and they were massive. There was one called Slapper, She's French. I mean, 
I just haven't seen that before. And there's a large part of your movie that's dedicated to this movie. Um, there was another one called Euro Trip, I think it was, which I've never heard of before. And again, a large chunk of the movie is dedicated to these movies. And I wonder, did you, are the, well, were these big movies for starters? But secondly, did you find joy in a lot of teen movies that were sort of seen as B-list teen movies that just told the story as well? Yeah, I think the the joy of that genre to me is that it it is kind of inevitably defined by lots and lots of small movies like that. You know, like not neither of those movies you just mentioned lost money. They both did fine, um, but like you say, they weren't like smash hits. Um, and I think that's nice because it means that teenagers who find them and take to them feel like they have their own little special film, their kind of intimate connection with a film that kind of touches them for whatever reason even if it is Slap She's French, which, like you say, has kind of resisted revival to some extent. Uh, it's one of the few films that's heavily featured in Beyond Clueless that isn't available on Blu-ray yet. Um, and there's a confusion because, although that sounds like the most American title of any film ever made, uh, weirdly, in America, it's called She Gets What She Wants. It's the one place that didn't use that that title. So I think, it, yeah, it's... It's doing its best to remain obscure by making it as complicated as possible for people to actually track it down. But it's worth a watch if you have a chance. I mean, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon for about $1.99. Um, or the iTunes store, no doubt. Or the iTunes store. Available for download. <laughs> Click buy. Um, <laughs> do, we have a, do we have another question? Oh, yeah, uh, just down here. Okay, um, since you've had to like watch all these films over and over again, what was your favourite teen film at the beginning, and was it still your favourite at the end, or did you have like a newfound love for some film you didn't think you would love as much when you finished? Yeah, in fact, it, it was the same at the beginning and the end, and, and it kind of comes back to that sense of it being the one that, for whatever reason, really hit home with me when I was a teenager, and watching it ad nauseum and reading into it at great length somehow didn't diminish that, it only made it stronger. Uh, and you've undercut me by already mentioning it. It was Eurotrip, um, which for me, yeah, it has had this sort of inexplicable presence throughout my life, um, which continues only to grow as it finally gets released on Blu-ray this year, um, just in time for inclusion in Beyond Clueless. And again, yeah, like when when I heard that they were releasing it on Blu-ray, I was obviously thrilled, but part of me thought, are they releasing this just for me? You know, who who else would buy this? Um, and then you start screening the film and, and watching it with other people. And s like that film has legions of followers, uh, apparently, who you know I think were just as excited as me when, when they could watch it in glistening 1080p, also available on, in the, on the iTunes store as an HD download, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, no, it, it somehow um, spending hours upon hours pouring over it and cutting it into something new. And I think it has more, uh, it appears more in Beyond Clueless than any other film, which is sort of showing my bias towards it. It also, from having done the live scores, it, there's a, a bit from it that gets the biggest laugh in the film. Yeah, and it's, a, re it's a really throwaway it moment, audience. isn't it? Yeah. We shouldn't say what yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, It's a great film. If, if you take one thing away from this panel, it's to go home and watch Eurotrip. <laughs> <laughs> Load up the iTunes store. Avoid the bit where it says Beyond Clueless, available now, uh, and just go straight to Eurotrip. <laughs> uh, we got another question, just we got two questions, so one just here. Really, really interesting. Um, I love just looking at the fact that it's a, a retrospective view on the team movie from, a, from, from where we are now, from 2015. Have you ever thought about uh, including any other language or communities or cultures in that, like deaf, deaf culture? Because we've got our own um, deaf culture that would have had um, a teen movie time and an 80s and a 90s um, cultural theme. It'd be great to see that. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, um, it's one of those things that we initially, starting out, wondered where to, to kind of draw the barriers. And... Our original intention was to be much more wide-ranging and kind of look across the world and you know try and draw from as many different places as possible and many different cultures as possible. Um, but what we quickly found is that for our purposes, we were talking about this incredibly like homogenous world that is very distinct to these American movies of that time. And I think, and it's certainly not you know a good thing. It, it means that they have a lot of um, 
kind of faults and uh, and are blindsided quite a lot by by not being able to see past their own limitations. But also, it means they have that incredible kind of self-contained familiarity that I think makes them quite a sort of unlikely subversive thing because you can get across these quite strange ideas in the midst of what otherwise feels like a completely repetitive trope filled world um so yeah it kind of comes back to what i was saying before about british teen movies it's like i really appreciate a lot of them but i i'm not sure they're as ripe for kind of overlaying on mass over the top of one another like this movie does because i think they are by their own nature quite idiosyncratic because there isn't quite as much of a kind of they're, they're not as like pervasive over our culture as these movies are okay uh, next question. But there's certainly space for other people to uh, make their own movies <laughs> that, that get into all kinds of other areas uh, that aren't explored in this film. Just what I would be interested to know is how long did it take you to actually make the movie? Was it about a year? Yeah, I everything seems to happen in Januaries. So we had, we got, we did the Kickstarter in January 2013 and then we uh, finished the film in January 2014 and then it came out in the UK cinemas in January 2015. So I'm expecting like uh, an Oscar January 2016 or some sort of restoration. <laughs> <laughs> um, just as a follow on to that, I think uh, anyone who'd be watching this and maybe, maybe some of you here, uh, it is a fascinating process, the idea of in your bedroom starting to make a movie. If you, if you had to give just like just a handful of just major bits of advice for I guess when it's when it feels like it's going nowhere, for when it feels like there's a massive hurdle to overcome. Like, what were the like big lessons that you've learned? I know that's a lame question, but I actually think if you can get them into little nuggets, they would be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you two think. I I would say that the most important thing for me was just trying not to think about the sheer number of things that had to happen between when we started and now, because um, I think there was so many massively uphill struggles to learn every step of this process that had I taken that all in at once, I think it would have felt completely impossible. Um, but you know, if you only think one problem ahead at a time, then learning how to set up uh, you know, a limited company or learning how to open a business bank account or learning how to rip a Blu-ray or whatever else it might be it suddenly seems more manageable when that's the only thing you have to do and then you can carry on. And also, like I was saying before, like promising someone that's given you money that you will show them the film is quite a good like imperative as well. Maybe if you're making a film off your own back, the answer is just to like get someone to give you a fiver and sign a contract with them saying that you will show them the film in a year's time and then whatever happens, you, you have to do that. I think as well we had an amazing team beyond the three of us. Catherine was our producer, she's sitting over there, and we had Anthony Ng and Billy Boy Cape, and they were just so instrumental. And I think Catherine in particular, I'm not just saying that because she's the only one that showed up, but <laughs> she was fantastic. I was so floored by how much she would go out there and, and just promote, 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 and just talk to everybody about it, hand out cards. I mean, it was it was audacious and it was shameless, but I think it made so much difference. And I think it gave Charlie so much support because then he didn't kind of have to worry about that. I mean, he's he also didn't do anything but work for a year, but it meant that he had somebody else sort of taking the reins with that side a little bit, which I think was so fantastic and moral support like if you if yeah. you do watch all six american pie spin-off <laughs> movies back to back you will need someone to come around at the end of the day yeah, and just Anthony sort of was so good for that. express human emotion to you in a recognizable yeah. way and to argue with you as well because i think a lot of it if you're having just one opinion on a film Anthony was so brilliant because he would say like they would have so many arguments about for example the girl next door which is one of the films that's featured in in Beyond Clueless and I think you guys are still in severe disagreement about your reading of the film yeah there is some fraught <laughs> debate and wasn't there a thing where uh, the, f the, the some of the really really obscure films that clearly weren't going to add anything to the message of the film as a whole you got Anthony to watch those ones just in case there was like a, a frame or two that could be incorporated in. Just locked in a room. Know, yeah, Anthony did take the bullet of uh, 100 Girls. Has anyone even heard of that? It's the worst No, film. there's a reason. Um, it's a film about an awful American teenage boy who somehow sleeps with a girl in an elevator and doesn't know how, who it is 
and then has to like work out over the course of the runtime which of a hundred girls in a uh, sorority it is. I don't know why I'm giving this film airtime. It really doesn't <laughs> deserve it. And it's probably not even available on the iTunes store, which is probably the not. only store in the world. <laughs> and therefore, if they don't have it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, we've, we've got time for one more question. If anyone, ha yeah, there we go. Uh, hi, uh, I love the uh, the clips. I really want to see the movie. I haven't seen it yet, but um, I was just going to ask. Obviously, all the clips are linked by genre. Um, what genre would you consider the film to be? Because it seems almost like more than a documentary, almost like a new type of of film. Where you know, it's almost like you, you, because you've used uh, a very different type of you know, it's very uh, nuanced type of voice in it, and also the way you've 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 worked the music into it, and the music's part of it. It seems almost like a sort of visual. DJing, stroke film criticism, stroke comedy. Is it just, just would you consider it as just a straight documentary or how would you? Yeah, no, thank you. you. That, that's amazingly uh, flattering. Um, certainly, no, there are like, uh, if I'm trying to find a, a quick way to describe it, I would say like an essay film. Uh, and I think there've, there's been an amazing explosion of essay films over the last few years that have made that form much more kind of accessible and, and popular. Um, so, certainly, you know, like, I was massively influenced by like Mark Cousins' films and Tom Anderson's films and Room T37, stuff like that. And I think Room T37 is a good example where um, it did something that we always wanted to do with this, where it was deconstructing something, deconstructing a genre, but also trying to embrace that genre as much as possible. And I think like one of the easy traps to fall into when you're talking about teen movies, because people often think of them as quite frivolous, is to kind of condescend to them and, you know, and by analyzing them, make out that you think they're kind of worthless. Um, and so we always wanted to make it feel like a teen movie as much as something that was talking about teen movies. I think, a, yeah, like you say, a big part of that is like making an audiovisual space that, that feels appropriate and that feels kind of suitably enthusiastic and yeah people like occasionally accuse it of being like too uh, kind of too like in love with the teen genre um but for me that was always a massive part of wanting to analyze that world is is that i felt such an affinity for it and i and i wanted to kind of challenge that affinity because you know they're incredible movies but they're not without their kind of mad contradictions and quirks Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before before we wrap up, why don't we why don't we play w the final clip uh, from the movie that we have? Uh, sure. Do you, you want to set that up? Yeah. No. This is um, it kind of comes back to that. We uh, I think like in advance I knew that there would be certain sort of tropes that would inevitably recur again and again. So stuff like graduation, stuff like prom nights, house parties. You kind of expect to see them. Um, this was a, a trope that I didn't realize going in. It's almost the most pervasive teen movie trope, but it seems really unlikely and not like something that you would expect to see. Um, but I would be sat there watching hundreds of these films and literally just kind of waiting for it every time and checking it off dutifully when it appeared. Um, so maybe the best thing is, is not to say what it is, except that it, it happens at the point always where one teenager is trying to kind of seduce the other, and this is like the go-to solution to that problem for some reason. Okay, well, uh, we should wrap up now. Uh, so Beyond Clueless is available now on the iTunes store. You can download that. Uh, candles are available at Veruza Volk's uh, online website if you want some of those. And um, you three are obviously, you're on Twitter as well. So if anyone watching this uh, has any questions for Charlie, Elizabeth, or Jeremy, uh, you can be on, got on at Charlie Line, at JWOJWO, and at Sankles, or at Summer Camp Band. Uh, watch the movie, download it, it's amazing. Thank you guys for being here today, and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.